my name's Ashley, Ashley Brown, and I work for the Ecosystem Restoration Communities Movement um, as the Education Coordinator. And we've been working on this project that has been funded by Erasmus, the Erasmus Plus program, which for those who aren't familiar is an EU funded program to facilitate a kind of cross country learning and sharing um, within the EU block. And it makes me very, very sad that UK isn't in the EU anymore, but I won't go into that now. Um, we have been working with our partner in Ireland called Shilter Cree. Um, Gareth, the man with the mug, is, <laughs> is calling in from Ireland. And we've been working together to visit different um, different projects and kind of different projects around the EU to learn about food hubs because food hubs are a way that the people in the ERC movement can um, create an income for themselves and food security for their communities. I won't go into it too much more than that because there's time for Gareth to do that, but I just wanted to give you all a very warm welcome and I'll hand it over to Gareth. Hello, everybody. So, yeah, thank you for joining us. It's amazing to see the, um, you know, the diversity and the wide range of people from most continents, I think, are seen there. So, thank you. And thank you, ERC, for, for holding space with us at Shields Creek. We're in Ireland, too. And I also just want to name who's been on this journey with us as well as Open Food Network Ireland and then Open Food Network. So, I see with Ron and Ronan there as well. So, um, yeah. So the idea behind this project was just to document our experience as a way of hope, trying to, how do we develop a resource? We're trying to work with restoring the ecosystems of Ireland. And we really feel that farmers offer so much potential. It's often pitted as farmers against the environment. But actually farmers are suffer from the same system that, 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 that we're all, we all suffer from in the environment most of all. So how can we create a system that, an alternative system too? So working with farmers to restore ecosystems, but then giving them a fair wage for the wage, so supporting them to direct sell it as well. So this is the journey we've been on. And to be honest, I, I, I got a bit worried when I seen the title of this of everything you wanted to know about a food hub because we haven't got it figured out. And we had a, a great two day course with people running this in Ireland and Ash was over. And in some ways, yeah, what, what's come up is that like, yeah, our current structures are are not conducive to fair, equitable work in the food system too. So, you know, we're, we're, yeah. So it's it, there's there's challenges there too. But what we've what we've done, we've our experience, and we hopefully document other people's experiences along the way to give some sort of supports along the way. And um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to share the manual that we've that we've developed as part of this project and just use it as a as a talking piece because the idea of the manual was to was to document um to document our experience too um, so i'm just going to share my screen gareth sorry yeah. to interrupt um a couple of us are just having a hard time hearing if you could just hearing. um up the volume that would be fantastic i know i was we were talking about this i'm not sure like i'm not sure what's the best way to do it um just like project your voice a bit more i think yeah just shout can't. more <laughs> I'll, um, yeah perfect so is that okay that's a bit better, better yeah. anyway so the food hub again it's a guide um it's a, a way of hopefully documenting our experience as well too so Hopefully it will be a support to different groups around the world to, to use food as a way of restoring ecosystems. So there's the partners too. I'm not going to do this. So I love this. We were lucky. We held a, a series of webinar talks and workshops earlier in the project. And we were lucky enough to have Vandana Shiva speak. And that yeah. you can put that online. There's a, that's a recording that you can check out too. And she just, in terms of decolonial, in terms of food food and seed sovereignty it's just a power okay. so really worth checking that out but that was one quote from it the revolution now is growing good food and eating good food um, and the purpose of the guide is to support people to support communities individuals and entrepreneurs around the world to um yeah to create fairer and food sovereignty communities 
Yeah, and it's for farmers, families, communities, and entrepreneurs too. So depending on depending on what your your niche is, um, and your maybe your your motivations for getting involved, whether it's trying to source good nutritious food for your family or create a a, a livelihood that's uh, in line with a value is a right livelihood, um, yeah, or a farmer to sell their produce. But so again, looking at how can food in terms of ecosystem restoration how can food be a contributor because that's particularly in ireland at the moment like the agricultural in ireland is is very damaging to the ecosystem too so how can we use food as a support for restoring ecosystems and that's really the the, the question and that we're, we're exploring and we're still exploring it and then going into john's work that many here will know about like what's possible and looking at you know in terms of what is possible what, with ecosystem restoration connecting that with the sustainable development goals, which are 17 goals that people may or may not know about, but that every government has signed up to. So then again, these are the links to, again, touching on regenerative agriculture, but also being using that word somewhat sparingly, because again, it's pointing back to, you know, the indigenous people from across the world and, and that have done practice this for a long time and before, you know, before regenerative agriculture was ever a word. So, the question that, that comes up again in this space too was, yeah, it all sounds good, but can local food systems actually really feed the world? So again, Vandana spoke to this and she said that already 80% of the food we currently eat come from small growers and is mainly local. So only 20% is from large scale industrial systems. And it's very, very expensive, both financially and ecologically. But the only reason it's cheaper in the supermarkets is because it's unfairly subsidized um, but but certainly most of the food we eat or a lot of the food we eat it does come from local sources so a food hub what is a food hub so our understanding of a food hub is and again it's drawn and building on the work with um open food network and open food network ireland they're one platform but they're the one we point to in this manual for particular reasons because it's open source and fits in with the values but so a food hub is a group of somebody bringing together growers or producers to, to sell online essentially an online farmer's market is how how I, I think of it too so using people can place orders online and then there's a pickup date too but a way of bringing together producers growers and maybe other sort of um, enterprises together to sell locally The need for it. So again, what, why, why a food hub? So again, one of the reasons that we're interested in it is in terms of some of them like self-reliance, economic recon reconciliation for restoring ecosystems, strengthening food security and food sovereignty, food as a commons, a way of engaging in climate action, seed at union and library. So it's a way of seed saving, new livelihoods and schemes. So yeah, creating fair livelihoods. Um, a new way of thinking and being enjoying using food as a celebration. M many of the communities that we work with or we, we talk to during this, like, they have community days and celebrations, soup kitchens and um, ways of bringing the community together have been a really great thing. So there's some of the reasons. And then in terms of local e economics, this is drawn in, like there's new economic finition, but they talk about how supermarkets talk about how often they create so many jobs and there was a, a Tesco opened in a in a town close to where I'm based before, and they said they're going to create a hundred jobs. But if you look at the research, it shows for a, for every one job they create, they cost at least one and a half. So they're creating one job, but they're costing 150. They're creating 100 jobs, but they're costing 150. So we're, we're actually losing jobs, and that's from closing farmers or delicatessens or bakers, etc. Too. So. Um, yeah, so again, the analogy that's often used is the leaky bucket. So we have this lo our local economies, but currently they're they're spraying out money because of corporate um, and or, or supermarkets, etc. Different ways of that this money is leaving our local economies. So that's just a little story you can read separately about looking at what the difference of buying local and buy, like spending 80% of your income in a local economy and the impact that that has for the local economy as opposed to like online shopping and supermarkets, et cetera. So these are just, these are guidelines that, that, that again, there's no set way of this is what to do to create a farmer's market. We had a two day training here with, with food communities around Ireland developing, trying to try either have done it or trying to do develop a food up. 
and the, these are the steps that seem to come out that are either things that they found useful or things that they would find useful. So there's 40. So understanding the context being key, and um, there's a lot in that. I'm not going to go through them all. You can look at them separately. Creating visions, um, the skills that are needed for a food hub, so project management, financing, marketing. Again, different niches, there's different things for different people. Everybody has a role. You know, what assets are in the community? You know, the legal structure that you that that the the the, the food hub wants to hold, whether it's a, we're a cooperative, but there could be a CLG or it could be a sole trader. And again, it might be different depending on your country, but like what's the legal structure and the benefits and negatives for joining that or setting that up. So there's some of them again taken on work that the OFN had done. Again, understanding finances, the money that's coming in and going out, just having a grasp of that. Um, yeah, so, you, you know, you know, it's like using money as a resource, but not as a, yeah, just as a way of supporting um, the, the work. And then how do we find producers? That's some part that we found a little bit struggle to do it too. So looking at things like OFN, woofing, other markets, word of mouth, door knocking. So finding who's in your community and who might be able or be interested in selling through the food hub. The platform, then you need a platform to sell on. We specifically mentioned the OFN because it's open source, and they, they talk a lot in their work that there might be different, even if it's got the best vision, a platform. If it's privately owned, it could either be closed down, and that hope happened with the food assembly, you know, in, in the UK, it wasn't making enough money, so the company just closed it because they weren't getting enough of a return. Whereas with the OFN, it's open source, and the values really align with certainly what Shield Decree is all about. I think what ERC is about, and I would imagine what most people on the call um, resonate with, like open food sovereignty, ecosystem restoration, social justice, et cetera. So how do we find customers? Again, leafleting, social media, like, but that's again a question. How do we, how do we get it? How do we get the, the people to actually invest? And, and that's, that's a challenge because, you know, in some ways food is misrepresented in terms of price. Um, yeah, all that. And then, yeah, partnership. So it's again, you don't have to do it all yourself. Working in partnership, work, working in collaboration, like like an ecosystem does, you know, there's not one dominant actually, there's all these interconnections all supporting the, the overall thing. So, yeah, and that. And then community using it as a way of community building and then community solidarity work. So, again, there's different ways and different groups have done that. So, from street fests to soup cafes to, um, cooking one family cooking for another etc cetera, etc cetera. so and um, there's different ways of building community and offering community solidarity and then yeah supporting meeting people we're at we, we wish that people um you know we maybe wish that people want to have this their you know shop in our local food hub but i remember talking about this at a workshop before the ills of supermarkets and all the jobs they cost and a woman said to me, she said, yeah, I'm a single mother with three kids and I have X, so I have X amount of money. So again, that's that system not being conducive to. So um, yeah, and, and then, you know, people are maybe unaware of like, the, in some cases, the damages that's been done. So meeting that. And how do we, how do we create resilient systems? A big thing that came up in our two days together is the burnout. People can start, whether it's growing or with the food up, really, really passionate, but actually, yeah, burnout being a really big thing. And just when we were doing the meeting the, the day before, one of the food hubs found out the woman, the person growing their food just wasn't going to do it this year because he, he just burnt out because it was just too much work and it was isolating doing it on his own. So how do we create when we're designing this that we have, that we don't burn out or we minimize the chances? And then, yeah, in terms of like, it's not just, we don't want to just create... Um these little islands we want to create system, systematic change too so advocating for change in our food systems and in our entire societal systems too and then again there's different case samples so i'm, I'm not going to get into some of these here we're going to talk about that. we were hoping to have them speaking at this but they were unable to make it last minute so um myself and ash are going to maybe give we visited that farm as part of the project so and there, again there's an online talk listen to um to uh, who have been talking about it. So again, you can check that. That's a really interesting model. So I'd encourage it. Um, and I'll come into that 
when we're talking about the food assembly. Again, it's not just important to look at all the examples that work. This is one Ashley was involved in and it didn't work. And it's important to look at well, what doesn't work and, and maybe why it didn't work and try and take learnings from that. Talk Jordan and Ireland, again, another eco village and a community farm. Gardens of Hope, again, that's when Dan Ashiva's. We put that in just because, yeah, there wasn't so much information about it, but it's, it's, it's great. And she was saying like, these are, like a lot of farmers in a region in India who committed suicide because of the food system and, and in different reasons. And so th th they started creating this thing called Gardens of Hope. And then she talked about during COVID when the big industrial systems weren't able to get out and meet such, it was th these women in the communities in the Gardens of Hope that were feeding the communities. So again, an example of an example. And Buddha, Buddha Vine, um, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but again, another farm that we visited. And, uh, anyway, so I like this quote. So local food systems, that is where you can make a difference. You can't create a different supply chain, but it's not our role. Your role is to build from the ground up, from the soil up, from the earthworm, so to care for the earth and care for communities too. So I really, food has been a really powerful way to yeah create the alternative system that we all, I'm assuming on this call, desperately want. And then, yeah, these are just reminders too. So... And then there's the invitation to join if you're not already involved in ecosystem restoration. Like, you know, we're a community across the world working for restoring the ecosystems of the world and from the ground up. So the invitation to join that too. So that is enough for me. Um, and yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit over time. So, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, I think we're going to have a section towards the end of the call, actually, where people can uh, ask any questions. Um, so let's keep it until then. Um, and I realised that was a very whistle-stop tour of, of everything. So the manual is there for you to read and look through in your own time. It was posted in the chat Um so just have a scroll up and you'll see a link to it there. A lot went into it. There were many, many visits to lots of different farms, as Gareth mentioned, and also speaking to people who have run their own food hubs and people who uh, want to start them and a lot of insights. Um, Brian just asked for a copy. Yeah, it's if you scroll up, Brian, you'll see that there is a link to it. Maybe Kath can post it again or i can post it again quickly yeah there you go um cool okay so we are very honored to have karim here with us he works for uh, an extraordinary ecosystem restoration community in the south sinai area of egypt which is an extremely dry and desertified region and yet they are growing all of this beautiful colourful, abundant food there to feed their, their community. And he's going to share exactly how that is working. Bearing in mind is Ramadan. This man has not eaten all day. So incredible, inc incredible, uh, incredible, basically, as someone who can't go through the day without eating. Um, yeah. And, uh, yes, I'm fasting and on my way for breakfast as well. So that's why I'm in the car right now <laughs> going uh, to have a talk with my friends ash i sent you the presentation if you can share it from your side that would be wow, great yes. uh, i'm going to take you briefly uh, on habiba food hub what we do and why we do it as well uh, habiba basically we started in uh, 2007 2008 uh, due to the economic crisis that happened and mainly we wanted to have our food security since we have uh, a lot of desert that we can cultivate and we have water uh, as well. Uh, so that's why we started to do uh, agriculture and uh, we are located in uh, Sinai Peninsula, South Sinai, Nueva in Egypt, as you can see in the map. Uh, if we can go to that slide and as i mentioned we started in 2007 and uh, our area it's mainly desertic 
even this is how the desert looks like and now i'm on my way this is how it looks like right now uh, i don't know if we're... they can see it karim because i'm sharing my screen uh, sorry sorry yeah. <laughs> so uh this is the desert climate that we have and we are working on re-greening our desert and uh, mainly we work with our uh, local uh, community which are the Bedouin uh, tribes that we have. We have two tribes, Mizena and Tarabin uh, tribe and those are the two tribes that we are working with mainly in Nueva and the third one is Jabalaya tribe in St. Catherine due to the weather it's different than Nueva than St. Catherine uh, now we have uh, more than uh, 75 farms. Uh, all of us, almost we all uh, work together, uh, trying to collaborate together and trying to uh, overcome our uh, obstacles that we face. Uh, because we have one of our projects, if you can go to the other slide, Ash, please. Uh, we have uh, several uh, food uh, hub here in Sinai. We have the local uh, market and uh, the green uh, box project and we have the processed food so the local markets were all the uh, local farmers uh, uh, how do you, uh, for, uh, farmers market we go and join our products over there and uh, regarding the weekly green box this is comes from habiba and from other uh, farms as well uh, in nueva that we deliver our products from farm to door uh, because we do crop rotation, we share our crops together, we sit, we see uh, what we're going to do in the season. Because here in Sinai, in Nueva especially, we work only uh, in farming around six months, seven months, uh, because of the heat. And uh, this is during winter time. And during summer time, we work in the olives, uh, trees, and in the dates as well. And then the last uh, processed uh, food that we have, that we turn our products into dry, like kale, we turn into kale powder, beetroot powder, moringa powder, all of those herbs, uh, we turn them into powder in order to uh, sell our products to Cairo. And we are glad uh, and proud that all our products now are plastic free, biodegraded with plastic, and the recycled package, the package itself, it's a recycled uh, cartoon uh, package. Uh, and one of uh, our uh, most, uh, and here's uh, product that we have are the dates, uh, the Majdul palm tree. This is the uh, type of the dates itself. And uh, we chose it for several reasons because of uh, it contains a lot of uh, nutrition facts. It's, uh, it's meaty, it's nice. Uh, people who have diabetes can eat it as well. It's not high, high with sugar. This is the part uh, of it from the nutrition part, but from the social responsibility part that uh, the, when we sell the dates, it sustains our learning center. Habiba, part of its social responsibility, we have a learning center. It's an after school for the Bedouin kids. And uh, the money that we generate from uh, those uh, dates, it sustained the learning center. And by this, this model can uh, cannot be stoppable because it's not attached to the business model. It's always attached to direct. Uh, learning center and uh, hopefully inshallah that uh, that trainer as well and other uh, teenager and the uh, elders as well Karen, remember, uh, this remember was to uh, our sorry just remember to tell me when to move to the next picture yeah 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 you can you can go to the next picture for ash no and no worries okay and yes see this is the local markets approach that we go we go uh, in Nueva and also uh, to the farmers market uh, in Dahab as well that we collect the vegetables from Habiba and from other uh, prod, uh, other farmers and we deliver you can go to the other slide the ash please mm -hmm. this is the green box initiative these are the boxes that uh, we deliver uh, to Dahab every week people 
uh, would order uh, from uh, a Google form what they need uh, from their uh, weekly vegetables and we collect them and then we start to distribute them uh, to the hub. Uh, in the few years, we used to do for them a, a box, a plastic box, but we stopped doing this kind of plastic box and now we're doing uh, cloth uh, bags, as in the picture the chef while he's putting with the vegetables in it. You can go to the other slide, please. And those are our end products of Habiba, the food process that we, we do from uh, olive uh, oil to uh, dates, as you can see on the left side, this is the package of the date uh, and the herbs that we have uh, from uh, moringa powder to kale powder, beetroot powder, chili powder, all of those uh, herbs, we turn them, uh, we dry them first and then we turn them into powder. And this is the final product that we uh, sell and send to Cairo and in Sinai as well. If you would like to go to the other slide, please. And this is how, how it, we collaborate with our uh, local farms. We uh, collaborate with them, we harvest, we collect, and then we, we sit every uh, winter time to discuss how we're going to collaborate together. And Alhamdulillah, things are going well uh, on different aspects and we're getting uh, bigger and bigger and expanding more and more. As you can see in the picture, this is melon harvesting. <laughs> he looks very happy with those melon. <laughs> oh, the best melons, <laughs> alhamdulillah. <laughs> As you can go to the other slide as well, please. Mm -hmm. And as I was telling to you, this is the adding value of it uh, from the palm trees uh, that uh, we have the Majdul dates. Uh, and this is the picture of, uh, of Majid, the founder of Habiba community and the kids at the learning center, having uh, fun in them. So I... Uh, if you can uh, go to the other slide. Sorry, we were uh, passing some uh, traffic. And of course, we, we are facing uh, some uh, problems always due to climate change. Every year we're facing uh, new obstacles from insects, from uh, heat uh, waves or even cold waves. And uh, salinity uh, also affects us. But uh, we are trying to, to overcome those obstacles as much as, uh, as we can with the tools and resources uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. Shall I go to the next one? Yeah, yeah please. As you can see from the other picture, uh, uh, the, the insects and uh, the, the effect of, of the insects on the dates and figs and stuff like that. And we're trying to treat them as much as possible and to face uh, those uh, climate change and insects that uh, are invading uh, our space every year. Uh, thank you all and I hope I was uh, clear. As you can see, those are the dates. Uh, this is Majid, uh, the founder of Habiba the greenhouse, our ducks, Pietro, one of our uh, superhero volunteers, happy with the harvest of the fox. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope I have uh, been clear in, in all the food processed uh, cycle that we have in, uh, in Habiba. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. All. Okay, great. Um, we have five minutes now if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Karim about their food hub model over there in the Sinai. Please raise your little yellow hand um, if you have a question or you can write it in the chat. 
depending on what you prefer. Or was, uh, was Karim so clear that there's no extra questions needed here? Okay, Yvonne. Uh, where's your question gone? Oh, how many customers slash households are you selling to, Karim? Mm, can't hear you. There we go. We have 36 uh, customers that we deliver to Dahab, and also we supply a couple of restaurants as well, vegetarian or vegan uh, restaurants uh, in Dahab around us. And uh, this is regarding the farm, the fresh products. But regarding the food processed unit, we supply almost eight uh, stores in Cairo and three in, uh, in Dahab as well. Uh, that we supply with them from dates to olives to uh, moringa powder, kale powder, all our uh, food processed unit. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Well, that's a question I also had, um, but I'll go with Nicole's first. Are you exporting your products? Can we buy them in Canada? Nicole asks. No, so far <laughs> we don't uh, export yet. Uh, we don't have the quantity to export. However, when we have, uh, since we work also in the tourism industry, uh, people take products of Habiba as giveaways or even to be used for their uh, personal usage uh, in their countries. Yeah, we were very lucky to take Gosh. some of these products home with us when we visited, and I've still got it in my cupboard downstairs. Had some of us the other day. Because that's one of the models right. on the open food network as well. One of the, 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 what some groups do is the solidarity work. So, you know, you could, if there's something you can't grow in your region, maybe connecting with a community whose work you want to support. So, for example, getting olive, olives from a Palestinian community who are facing oppression. You're, 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 so you're buying directly from the, the, them to sell it to. So, for the, this is the question within the food hub. Do you, buy, do you eat just locally or do you buy from the wider range of things like dates from um, from, from, from Karim, um, but buying them, sourcing, bringing them in and then doing it that way. So it's just, a, a, yeah, that is something that some communities are doing. Mm. Uh, there's a question here. How do you, how did you find your customers, Karim? It's a big question, isn't it? For everyone working in this kind of area. Uh, by uh, going to the farmer's market, this helped us a lot. To, to interact uh, with our customers. This was the first phase. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one through awareness and, and branding uh, of Habiba products and the cause as well of the product that we, we, uh, we have, like the dates that it sustained the learning center. Uh, all of this kind of things helped us to, uh, to engage with the market and to, uh, to sell our products in it. Mm. And, our, and our mindset that we complete, we don't compete. So we don't have a competition by the meaning of competition because we collect the vegetables from Habib and from other farms. So everybody is doing its part from the, uh, from the uh, locals as well and our uh, partners. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any more questions here, I think we'll move on to the next part of the of the webinar today. So I'm going to be, well, me and Gareth are going to be presenting a model um, that we visited when we were in the Netherlands, which is called Heerdeboren. Um, I hope the Dutch people in the call think that I said that okay. Me and Gareth have been <laughs> struggling to pronounce these very Dutch words, but um, that's fine. And we were very blown away by this model because it's working really, really effectively there. Um, someone was meant to be here with us from Hiraburin today, but they couldn't actually make it in the end for a last minute emergency reason. So I'm going to show you a video of the model and then run through a few little extra pieces about it because me and Gareth 
are lucky enough, and Christina, who's here, uh, to visit last year. So I have a, a notebook stacked full of notes about this place. I know quite a lot about it. So I'm going to share the film now. Oh wait, sorry, no, I have to do, I have to press a special thing when I'm sharing a film that I forgot to do, one second. Oh no, it was there, okay, cool. Ik ben wel in voor iets nieuws. Het is iets, je bent, je kunt het zelf doen. Hè? Het is niet wachten tot iemand een geleerde het uitdoktert of een minister of een bestuurder het voorschrijft. Je bent gewoon zelf aan zet om op een andere manier naar je voedsel te kijken. Herenboeren is een groep mensen van ongeveer 200 huishoudens investeert in een uh, oprichting van een eigen boerderij. Ze pakt de grond, yes, yes. ze nemen een boer in dienst en die uh, produceert het eten dat, ze, dat de leden willen eten. Je weet gewoon echt letterlijk waar je eten vandaan komt. Ik ben voornamelijk om dat logistieke, dat ik gewoon vlak bij mijn eten ben. Dat ik mijn varkens ken, dat ik weet uh, welk varken geslacht wordt. Dan hoor je er eentje. En ook dat we daar eigenlijk zelf uh, op sommige momenten ook nog aan hebben meegewerkt. We hebben op de plantmachine in het voorjaar bijvoorbeeld mee de, de plantjes gezet voor de kolen. Wat belangrijk is, is dat, dat de herenboer mede-eigenaar is van deze boerderij. En dus ook mede-eigenaar is van alles wat hier geproduceerd wordt. En dat je dat op na een aantal maanden op een gegeven moment weer van je land af mag halen, inderdaad, ja, dat, is, dat is prachtig. Je laat zien dat je met een groep mensen een boerderij kunt oprichten en daar met elkaar van kunt eten. En door die stap te zetten als individu, draag je gewoon langzaam bij aan een stapsgewijze transitie naar een nieuw voedselsysteem in Nederland. langzaamaan dat herenboeren vanaf een plek waar gewoon voedsel geproduceerd wordt steeds meer een maatschappelijke beweging wordt over gewoon een andere manier van in je eten voorzien. We zijn onderdeel van de herenboeren zeg, en daar ben ik ook trots op inderdaad. Van hetgeen wat je dus hier van het land krijgt inderdaad. Ja, dat, is, dat is gewoon heel mooi, want daar staan wij ook voor. Het samenkomen op de boerderij bindt ons allemaal. En daarmee voel je je deelgenoot van een groter geheel. En dat begint bij onze eigen herenboerderij. Maar het is eigenlijk veel groter. Ooit begonnen aan dit concept om uit te rekenen met de gedachtesprong wat als elke Nederlander zijn eigen boerderij zou hebben. Daar krijg je 17 miljoen boerderijen van. Dat is natuurlijk niet doenlijk, hè? dat ga je niet maken. Daaruit komt hoeveel mensen heb je dan nodig om op één boerderij. Hè? Dat, is, dat is het concept van de herenboerderij. Maar terugkijkend naar 17 miljoen Nederlanders. En je zou dat met 500 monden per boerderij zoals we het hier doen, dan heb je 35.000 bedrijven nodig om Nederland op deze manier te kunnen voeden. En als die 20 hectare zijn zoals deze... Dan heb je dus 35.000 keer 20 hectare, dat is 700.000 hectare. En 700.000 hectare is minder dan een derde van het Nederlands buitengebied. Dus het, het, het is mogelijk om met dit systeem of met een vergelijkbaar systeem uh, al die consumenten uh, te, kunnen, te kunnen voeden en te binden. Ja, je moet de tijd in steken, maar als je het dan eet, dan weet je ook gewoon, ja, dit is, dit is gewoon lekker. Kijk om je heen, dit is toch veel leuker dan Albert Heijn. En ik kom nog steeds wel eens in de Albert Heijn hoor, dus het is ook niet zo dat dat weggaat. Maar ik vind het ontzettend leuk om iedere week op een boerderij te komen en gewoon te zien hoe men eten tot stand komt. De 2000 euro die wij eenmalig investeren, geeft je eigenlijk een leven lang toegang tot eerlijk, traceerbaar, veilig en duurzaam geproduceerd eten. Als je dat op een leven lang ETZ is die 2000 euro eigenlijk helemaal niet zoveel geld. Wij willen allemaal geen nummer zijn, maar op de een of andere manier is het nummer van je lidmaatschap op deze herenboerderij is een soort van uh, uh, trots die je uitstraalt van ik ben lid nummer, ik ben lid nummer 46. En dat is, ja, ik krijg er nu alweer kippenvel van, dat is mooi. Als we met z'n allen dit gaan doen, dan hebben we daar gewoon op 700.000 hectare Nederland gewoon echt veranderd. Echt veranderd. Dan hoef je alleen maar zelf lekker door te gaan eten. Op het moment dat je nadenkt over het investeren in een huis en in je huisvesting, dan wordt er makkelijker geïnvesteerd of een hypotheek afgesloten. Terwijl we het hier over iets anders bazaals hebben in ons leven, namelijk de primaire behoefte aan voedsel. En dus 
eenmalig een investering doen van 2000 euro om een leven lang toegang te hebben tot je voedsel, is in dat licht gezien eigenlijk een kleine bijdrage. Dus investeer in je huis hartstikke goed, investeer ook in je voedsel. Ja, so, to summarize, uh, this model is essentially a community supported agriculture scheme, which is where the community invests and kind of promises the growers in advance that they will buy the food from the grower, which gives the grower or growers the um, the kind of faith that they can go and produce this food because they will have customers to sell it to. But what they've done with this model is they've um, asked people to invest in being co-owners of the farm. So, so each family, uh, there's 200 families of roughly 500 people, each invest 200, no, 2,000 euros, which produces uh, a total amount of 400,000 euros and then that's enough to buy or rent uh, the farm and pay the farmer a really decent salary. The sal salary of the farmer is roughly 60,000 euros, which is a lot more than farmers normally make. Um, and the customers kind of feel a real sense of, of ownership over the farm because they co-own it and therefore they really care for the land. They really care for the animals and they're really committed to that place as that's now theirs and that's where they get their food from. Um, and this model has been so successful that they are now rolling out many, many other um, examples of this all over the country, I think. The last time we spoke to Budavine, um, they are working on 50 more farms like this around the country and also in Belgium. Um, and when we went to visit, what we really loved was that there, there's all this experimentation going on all the time. So, for instance, some of the members were really passionate about food forestry and wanted to start... Uh, a little food forestry section on the farm and so they were like yeah sure it's yours you know here's a plot for that you can you can grow those trees yourself you can manage that side of it and they did and they've done tests to show that the soil in that particular part of the farm is the best than the, you know the whole rest of the farm so the customers or the co-owners have real autonomy as well over um the way that the land is managed uh I think from memory, you can select the kind of food that you want. So you can you can choose vegetables, you can choose vegetables and meat, you can choose vegetables, meat and eggs um, and fruit. They do fruit as well and they do grains. I think they do everything apart from dairy. That's right, Gareth, from memory. Um, and yeah, there's just this real sense of community. So there's lots of community. Uh, community events that are put on that give people a real sense of belonging because that's something from the from the training that we did that we realized okay for a hood hub to be successful you kind of have to be more than just a place that people go and get their food from like what is it that the supermarket system doesn't give people it doesn't give people a sense of belonging and connection a to the land b to their food and c to each other and that's something that food hubs and these sorts of alternative models do give people. And this is something that the Hereborn model does really, really well. A um, little bit more detail. So you go every week uh, and there's like set days. There's like a Wednesday and a Saturday, I think, where you can go at a, at a time and collect what you want. And you're just given what's in season. And then if there's anything else that you don't, if there's anything from what you're given that you don't like, you can take it and put it in like a swap area. So you can swap it with something that other people also don't like. And that's that's their way of doing things. Rather than going on and ordering, you just say, I want 
meat and vegetables and eggs and then you go and you take what is in season the meat is sold in bulk as well so you buy all of your meat in one go in a couple of months i think and then you, you put it in the freezer yeah, that was another one kilo or 18 kilos a year per person so it's like the average i think yeah person eats, i think 16 or 17 kilos and yeah it's about that and I think they were saying that they were going to reduce that as well for like carbon emissions reasons. Um, what else did I want to say about this model? Uh, you can join as a trial member, I think. So you don't have to buy straight away. You don't have to invest straight away. Uh, and you join for 10 weeks and you pay 10 pounds a week for your food, which is very, very affordable. And 25% of their trial members then decide to join them. Um, they spend 8% of their budget on rent and the standard rental period is six years. And then after six years, the landowner needs to start paying back any of the investment that the farmer has paid, which assures that the land is secured for them into the future, which means that they can do things like plant trees, and do more perennial food growing which obviously takes quite some time to produce food and you wouldn't do that if you were renting land because it's not a secure tenancy um yeah it's just a really incredible model really and it's working really well so that's why we wanted to show you that one um i'm wondering gareth did you want to add anything just it's interesting Interesting again in terms of, and again, this is not a an academic research, but if you just do it loosely to say, there's they feed five hundred people on twenty hectares. So we're looking at that as part of the manual. So according to Eurostats, there's their EU farms are, use one hundred and fifty seven million hectares of land for agricultural production in two thousand twenty, and that's thirty eight percent of total land. That thing, if you use the twenty hectares feeds five hundred people. And then they say, sorry, there's 447.7 million inhabitants living in the EU. So it's 447 million and using 157 million hectares. If you use 20 hectares, feeds 500 people using this regenerative model, then, then the, that number of people would be fed on 894 hectares. So you're basically drastically reducing the amount of land used in agriculture that then could be rewilded or returned back to nature and um, you're know, used for other practices or, or just let go so yeah in terms of and somebody mentioned it there in the questions about the maths in the video that yeah using it as a way of um more regeneratively but more lower like growing higher in foods in smaller amounts and then return that the rest of it back to wider nature yeah someone said it really busts the myth that uh the way that food is grown now industrially is done so because it's the most efficient which uh, i think a lot of us realize is not the case um someone's asked a question how many months of the year is food supplied as far as i know every month there's always something that they have because they they uh don't just grow vegetables you know they grow vegetables they meat eggs fruit um grains there's always something, uh, whatever's in season is what, and what is growing at the time is put in the, in the kind of stall, market stall area of the farm where people go um, either on a Wednesday or a Saturday to collect and they take whatever they want and then they swap out whatever they don't want. Yeah. With this one, there's nothing in there. Land in Europe is used for export oriented crops. Yeah, like it's an important question because the model is, in, is inherently flawed. And then how much of that is then dumped in other markets because of trade policy, trade laws, all this, et cetera, thing too. But again, if you use this model as imagine like growing food, local food to grow as much as possible, and then yeah, like again, it's not we don't have we, we don't claim that it's an exact calculation of all humans need made in a closed loop, but it's it's just a, an interesting think piece. Um, but it's, again, there's 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 other issues with trade. Indeed. The video there of it's part of this because there's a couple of webinars. We'll put all the links to the three different webinars 
but one is with Breeding Hind talking with here here again next week. Yeah, it's really interesting module. Uh, what I really love too is the farmer gets like sixty grand. Like in Ireland, certainly farmers are struggling to make a living, and you know, and and then it's kind of like the, it's to do it as a second job, whereas this is like a an honourable prof profession, and he's getting they're they're the ones getting a fair wage for it. Yeah, interestingly though, to kind of play play to push things to the other side of the seesaw as i like to say i was talking to another um regenerative farm that is selling food via a hub also in the netherlands that we visited called bodem zeicht um i'll put it in the chat b o d e m z i c h t uh which is now run by a man who was volunteering at the first ecosystem restoration camp in Spain when I was there. It's really nice to see him now running his own farm with his partner. Um, and then what they were saying was that the Hiraburan model is very, very community focused and the farmer grows what the community wants to grow. And therefore the farmer doesn't have very much say or autonomy over what, or creativity over how he farms. Um, and that was their kind of point of view on it, um, which is also true, you know, so like it's very subjective as to what makes the best model here. But that's just something to add in as well. Yeah. How important is organic production to the success of food hubs you've visited? You mentioned regenerative a couple of times. Do you mean organic? um yes none of the models that we visited use pesticides or fungicides um and what i mean by regenerative is that they are purposefully working on building up the fertility of the system all the time um so things like rotating animals so that their organic matter from their urine and their feces is like put back into the soil um they are experimenting with perennial systems like food forestry etc which is known to be very good for the soil as well and building back up that organic matter layer and increasing biodiversity um so i guess you'd call it regenerative organic yeah but it's not necessarily like we talk about regenerative it might not necessarily have the label organic like it might because that's not the certified yeah so a lot of the farms within this and outside of the visit they might say call themselves air friendly and they certainly don't use pesticides or any of these things but they might not be after but it might not particularly just be interested in getting the label organic we often say too that like think about having the community model rather than having one accredited or certi certifier coming to visit you once a year when you have all your customers coming, you have, say, in Hillands, 500 uh, certifiers coming every week. To <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is yeah. some feedback I hear as well from smaller scale growers that getting organic certification is quite expensive and it's something that they don't feel like they really need. Um, so you can still use certain different sprays in that in organic as well too so regenerative is more about how do you build soil and, and, and that too so again sarah's asking the same question so they, they, they're practicing you know building ecosystems but they might not be labeled organic yeah so are we now at the point where we can open the floor to more general questions is that what we're doing now okay cool yeah, so we've got a little bit of time left before we sign off and um, just for more kind of general questions and discussion if anyone wants to bring a point they want to talk about for a while to do with this topic. Make the most of being a community here in the room today with lots of people interested in this sort of thing. I have a question. 
great. Um, I'm keen to know whether this is, um, obviously that the farmer's market concept is, is nothing new, but the food hub and the move towards the online food hub movement, is, is this a new movement? I mean, you guys have been exploring it now through these workshops, um, all the research you've done to put in the handbook together, but is this something that is, it's becoming more embraced now? Or has it been going for a while or has the online um, uh, revolution, which I really shouldn't say because things have been online for 30 years, but has has that aided or, or certainly the people becoming more accustomed to online shopping, I guess, has that really aided the movement? Hmm. I wonder whether Yvonne wants to answer this. What do you think, Gareth, seeing as she's working in this field? I was thinking that too. Yeah. yeah. I think it went up, uh, yeah, so Yvonne, you can come in there, but just say, I think it, it, it really boomed during COVID time. Matthew, but yeah, Vaughn, your, your thoughts would be really good. Yeah, um, thanks very much for putting me on the spot, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I guess my own involvement um, is quite new in the space and it was absolutely um, prompted by the pandemic and um, the need to pivot to an online solution when when our um, our face to face market locally was was shut down, and that was certainly the experience in the OFN um, world. Um, sales um, through existing shop fronts and hubs just um, multiplied; they exploded really through through COVID, um, and it felt like something that might stick. But um, that hasn't been the experience, unfortunately. In a lot of cases, we've seen the volumes, um, uh, you know, slip back to to um, almost uh, pre-COVID levels, um, and that coupled with the challenges now of the cost of living crisis around, you know, just the cost of energy and, and so on, um, has meant that actually a lot a lot of the the hubs that that we see, or a lot of hubs in different in different parts of the world, are are struggling, um, because their margins are are tight, um, and yeah. So, um, the question is whether it's, whether it's a new thing, um, I don't know. I don't know whether it's a thing even yet. To be honest with you, it it is. It, it certainly has um has experienced that that roller coaster in in the recent. Uh, past with the pandemic and stuff, um, where where it's settling, I'm not I'm not entirely sure of where the trend is going, but, um, certainly, um, the broader trends in terms of you know, um, everything moving online and and um, you know, e-commerce e and all of that would suggest that this should be it should be a a good bet, <laughs> but there's so many other factors that impact how people, um how people purchase their food and and um i think convenience is such a huge it's such a huge thing it's such a, a huge um challenge to to um you know compete with the supermarkets and i think it it, it brings us back to the the comment that ash made earlier around you know how we can differentiate food hubs from supermarkets um what can we offer that the supermarket doesn't offer? Um, if that isn't 24 seven opening, which it generally won't be, um, what are all those other value added um, uh, um, pieces that we can offer to our communities and indeed our, our farmers? So um, yeah, that's, I know, not a definitive answer, but maybe a little bit of flavor of what we're seeing in the OFN world anyway. Mm, thank you, Yvonne. I, I run a, a food hub myself, 10 years ago now uh, that was an online model um we ordered online and then you've collected in person and that's the food assembly model that i've written about in the manual um which wasn't a huge success well it was a success at first when it was like a uh kind of novel thing you know i think people really do care about where their food comes from um but often not enough to kind of put an evening aside every week to go and pick their food up so that was where their their model kind of slipped seeing as we were in london and people in london have extremely busy extremely busy lives and going to collect their food from a cafe rather than from the supermarket and having to do it at a fixed day of the week didn't give them enough of an alternative that was appealing enough. 
So I think what's interesting about the Hirabora model and the Bodemzicht model that I posted about in the chat is that they offer people real connection to a place and to, to a community and to the land and to nature because that is something that people living in cities especially do really crave is having somewhere to go that is beautiful and regulates their nervous systems and makes them feel good and they get to meet new friends and they get to be together and there's so much more to it than just getting better food and I think that's one of the main learnings that we've taken away from this this whole experience really um yeah nicole just asked a question there too about the structures of, of food hubs too again that would be like are they do they tend to be non-profit or for-profit companies again it would depend on the context um, and so that's why and villain maybe you could talk about this again but ofn that's why we're more interest to shield decree towards OFM because it's open source so we're a non-for-profit but the problem with the if it's for profit again the food assembly one they, they were they were running and they were reaching out in the UK but they weren't making enough profit so they just closed it so if you were supplying a community through that platform at that time you're just closed down so that I mean that's the very um yeah whereas open food that that couldn't happen too so i think a lot i would imagine most of the, the if you're set, set up in terms of the manual we said who's it for it's either for 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 um communities and families possibly if you were coming from that angle you'd be in it'd probably be a non-for-profit structure but you could i could imagine being a for-profit structure too but again um that would be a context i mean there is the question that comes up a lot too should food be traded upon like just from an ethical and from like a from a global point of view, should we be taking food as a way of food, as a way of making profit? Like obviously livelihoods and, and fair livelihoods are important, but um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I really answered your question, but uh, if any, Nick, uh, Yvonne or Ashley, or if anyone else wants to come in and answer more. Yeah, I mean, I just, I suppose by virtue of our, our own um, ethos and that, um, you know, the platform users for OFN would tend, I suppose, to be not-for-profits, uh, community interest companies or cooperatives, but they don't have to be. There are also um, plenty of shop fronts that are that are um, run by, by farmers themselves and in, also some who act as hubs. So they would be maybe offering their own facilities as an, a, um, an aggregation site. So they, they sell their own produce and they also sell produce of a number of their, their neighbor farmers or whatever on their own location. So um, it's quite flexible in that regard. Um, obviously there are a lot of e-commerce platforms out there that, that um, have a lot more money behind them and resources behind them and they're, they're all singing all dancing um so enterprises that would have that would have um uh you know space and and um resources on their own side to be able to invest might be attracted more to to those but certainly um i'd say the bulk of i, I don't know the stats but the bulk of our users um would probably be aligned in terms of their operation and, and legal structure but there's, there's the, we we absolutely um serve farmers and enterprises as well that you know there's no restrictions in terms of the the profit structure okay so we're going to close off in a minute um i'm wondering if anyone else wants to share anything and i hope that this has been yeah, useful and stimulating for everyone. It's a very important topic, in my opinion. And it feels very nice to be here with everybody who cares so much about this sort of thing. <laughs> all right, cool. I think that's probably it then. So lovely to meet you all and see some familiar faces, etc. And if you are creating your own food hubs, more power to you. The world needs us. Let's go. <laughs> I hope the sun's shining for you today. And yeah, see you soon.